in the world. There seem to be opportunities to speak about how you would or how or who would change the world. So when I was young, I wanted to change the world. And I'm not here to speak basically about how I failed. Um, but along the way, learn to help other people change their worlds, and in the process, begun to change my own. Um, so to go to the beginning, where I'm coming from, as you can see, I'm quite small. Um, it's a big old world out there. I'm also the youngest of six children, so I grew up very much surrounded by a lot of bigger people with their own agendas and stories. And it was a very blessed background, quite privileged, quite unusual. And I was raised to believe that people can do anything, pretty much. We had in the family explorers, artists, musicians, writers, politicians. The people who came around all the time, you know, they, they, they were in the government, they were writing bestsellers, they were, we, we lived in a house where Peter Pan was written. I mean, life seemed like a fairy tale. I thought it was like that for everybody. But I came to realize I did. The other thing is that with all those people coming around, I thought, you know, they, were, they all seemed to be family. They, they were either brothers and sisters, or they were cousins, or they were friends and cousins, or cousins and friends, and, you know, the dogs and the plants, and everybody seemed to be part of the family. When I started learning about evolution and where we all come from way back, actually, we are all cousins. And so I really felt. When I, felt, when I saw suffering, I really felt it. And when I learned about poverty and starvation, I felt that deep in my heart, as if it was my brother in the next room, which is someone on the next bit of land instead. And, and so I felt things were wrong. Things were wrong. It's not fair. You know, that's where every kid says that. It's not fair. But it's really true. There's a lot in this world that's really not fair really out of balance. So, yeah, I wanted to be different and I wanted to change things. And I think one of the people who was around when I was young was um, a man William Golding, who's a novelist who wrote The Lord of the Flies, and also came up with the, the name Gaia, a Greek goddess, for the idea of the earth being one living being, a whole series of systems of, of life and interaction, ecology, ecosystems, all interacting and keeping a kind of balance that is the climate, the world, the, the food, the water, the atmosphere that we have grown into and that we need to live. So I felt that very strongly in my life as well. But I suppose also because I was born in the year that people first went to the moon. And we have that image of this planet that we live here on. Gem. And I was given this like crazy space edge name that means life. So, so yeah, I felt, I guess I was raised also with this position, a feeling of responsibility because we did have this privilege. I'm from London, I'm a wife, I'm from the love. Just to start with that is a huge privilege. Whether you're small or female, these are sort of compared to most people on this earth, you know, just by the accident of birth. And my mother told me, you know, we're all nothing. Like that. We have to give back. We have a responsibility to give back. So that's been trying to work out how to, how to do that. It's been a big old journey. And uh, I'm not quite there yet. And there's been a lot of failure. Uh, I thought I could fly like this pan. When I was a kid, I woke up one morning out of the reef, flying in the night, and tried to fly down. I got my head. Yeah, my, my, my uncle, Peter Scott, was a major conservationist who did a huge amounts for nature, for looking after nature. Uh, but he still failed, you know, we still haven't turned around the ship of capitalism and development to make it sustainable, make it humane to humans, let alone other plants and animals. Yeah. My grandmother's, his father, my grandmother's first husband, he was another successful failure. Um, uh, Captain Scott went to the South Pole. The expedition failed. He died there 700 years ago, this month. But they brought back learning. They brought back wisdom, science, 
stories of heroism that this country is going in the cities. And, and also, if you hadn't died, my grandparents wouldn't have met. So even you know, in failure, we, we, we are resulted from that failure, our family. So it's a it's strange, strange story. So anyway, so coming back to changing the world, you know, a lot of people think, well, you do your bit, you give to charity. Well, you know, that's great, that's good. But when I was roaming around in the world, sort of running away from my privilege to come be with travelers and musicians, you know, on the underground side, activists, I went and joined the anti-road protests in the 90s. And I met a lot of people there for whom the world looked very different, and they didn't really feel that charity was dignified. They didn't want to receive cha charity. And I met, encountered the Zapatista movement. I don't know how many of you have heard of them, indigenous Mexican people who stood against the uh, free trade area of uh, North America. And, and an indigenous Zapatista woman, she said, if you come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then stay. Maybe we can work together. So, yeah. It's about reaching out and finding common ground with people, however different. We're also born of this earth, living under this star, and seeing how we can work together for all of our liberation together. We're social animals, and we need harmony to maintain our systems, to maintain institutions like this. It doesn't work if all of each other's necks, throats, if we're competing for everything, if we're just trying to get self-interest in each other. What works is when we try and find a balance between interests. We never quite get to balance, but evolution, evolution of matter, the rules of nature, evolution of biology, these plants and animals, all of that is about disruption and then things try to come into balance again. And the same with our society, we're constantly disrupted and we're constantly trying to come to balance. But there is no equilibrium, there is no perfect justice, in my experience. I'd love to be proved wrong. We're all on this journey towards trying to find it. And, you know, that's why we have things like the state, that's why we have tax, which get taxed more than the poor. That's why when things start to feel out of balance, people say, hang on, they're shooting more black guys in Tottenham than they are white, they shouldn't be shooting anyone at all, but nobody's doing anything about this. Then you get, you know, you get graffiti, you might get a demo, it builds up and builds up, and then, you know, if it's not dealt with, if we get too out of balance, we get riots, and it gets worse don't try and rebalance. So for me it's a lot about working to rebalance. So yeah, I found myself as a postgraduate doing a study of global environmental aid. This just brought everything together for me. It's about global justice, it's about trying to help, it's about conservation and nature. And I was able to do a political analysis of how billions of dollars that came out of the first Rio World Summit were actually being spent, who actually was benefiting, whose knowledge was forming this, and where it was going, and what it was doing on the ground. And goodness, that was a wake up. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the first thing I learned was where you stand depends on where you sit. People with money and power tend to value nature and each other in terms of whether they produce or have money and power. People who don't have money and power, people who are maybe living close to the land, living in relation to their ancestors and considering the descendants, much more connected in the circle of life, they tend to have more of a, a connection with nature on a deeper level. It's something you can't sell, you can't buy, you can't put. Value. So this book that I wrote, A New Green Order, is basically about the kind of clash between these two worldviews, which is still going on. When you look at the new agenda coming with the green economy, it's basically payment-free system services. But that's not going to be very, very far. 
So yeah, the other thing I learned, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. <laughs> These are great lines that you just pick up around the place. <laughs> and for the plants and animals, that's very clearly true, but also for the indigenous people who quite often live in the places where the tigers or the trees are. Because, you know, they're not heard. Their way of knowing, their words, their feelings are not. There's no space for them in a logic of money and power and greed and work. So they're, they're somewhere outside. And, and so for me, the most exciting thing and the thing I learned from that, that research, I, got, I turned up in India to the, the global environment facilities from global assembly. And then these people had come two days travel across India from the forest where there was a really problematic project. People like you, people who feel privileged to come and, and to see what it is like where we are and to tell our stories because nobody listens to us. But maybe with you, maybe with your tools, your technology, and your profile, and your science degrees, maybe they'll listen to you and you can help us speak. So we went. And um, it, was, it was amazing to see through the eyes of people completely outside to bring their words into what they call the world of books and computers. Which, um, yeah, so we played the first little video. Um, we took a little promo video for the Global Environmental Aid and showed it in the forest. And then helped them to make a response. The earth gives us a rich supply of natural resources, each one of them nurturing life in all its majesty but we are in danger of destroying this precious mosaic. Poverty forces millions to overexploit nature, while uncontrolled growth often ignores environmental safeguards. We must therefore take up the challenge, fight climate change, protect our plants and animals. The Global Environment Facility, caring for the planet. Swasantra Kaadana Sigurma Jidala, Tindu Aramdali Rajaragi Adhe Patkvi. That's why we live in the world. This is the name of the Nautka. If you are in the world, you will be in the world. If you are in the world, you will be in the world. If you are in the world, you will be in the world. 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 I got embroiled in that debate, uh, trying to defend the bank, get the facts on the table, the consultation, negotiation, hopefully reaching agreement and then implementing a, a collaborative way of managing these natural resources. <laughs> well I think there's a genuine, <clears throat> very heartfelt need on the part of the um, of the people featured in the in the video here to um, to work with uh, their their local authorities, their forest department in in a, in collaborative ways to to better manage the the forest resources. अरे सब बर्दना ही है इंडिया का यूरो बर्दी दें तो इंडिया बाहरी तुम्बा इम्से ही तो तेजे इम्से ही तो इलान तला सिकपटो इधर ना सरपर स्थाई दिवे ये सब ये क्लाम हो ये लगा डे देश दले नोडे और कष्ट इंगी दे ना तो ये लाडी सरकार की गुत्ता एकर बोलो उरंत साकर दिना ये अष्ट कड़मे आगे दे इम्से 
ಅವರು ಹೋಗಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳೋದನ್ನ ನಾವು ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಯಾವ ಕಾರಣದಲ್ಲಿ ನೀವು ಓಡಿಸ್ತೀರಿ ಅಂತ ನಾವು ಮರಡಿ ಕೇಳೋಕ್ಕಾಗಿತ್ತು ನಮಗಿದ್ದೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇದ್ದೇ ಇಲ್ದೋದ್ರೂ ಕೂಡಿ ನಮ್ಮ ತಲೆ ಮಿದಿಲಿಂದ ನಾವು ಅಷ್ಟಾದರೂ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಓಡಿಸಿ ನಾವಿಲ್ಲಿ ಜೀವನ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇರೋದು ಆಗ ಈಗೀಗ ಈಗೀಗ ಎಲ್ಲ ಈಗೇನೆ ಬಂದು ಎಲ್ಲ ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಗಿ ನಾವು ಒಂದು ಕಮಿಟಿ ಸೇರಿಕೊಂಡು ಒಂದು ಸಂಘ ಕಟ್ಟಿ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಬಂದು ಈಗ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಸಾರೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಓದ್ತಿರೋದು ಕೋಟಿ ಹಣ ತೆಗೆದು ತಂದಿದ್ದು ನಮಗೆಲ್ಲ ಜಮನಿ ಮನೆ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಕಾಡನ್ನು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಕ್ಲೀನಾಗಿ ಕೆರೆಗಳೆಲ್ಲ ಕಟ್ಟಿಸಿ ಅದು ನೀರು ಪ್ರಾಣಿಗಳು ನೀರು ಕುಡಿಯಕ್ಕಂತ ಇರೋದು ನಾವು ಕೆರೆಗಳು ಕಟ್ಟಿಸ್ಕೊಬೋದು ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ನೆಮ್ಮದಿಯಾಗಿ ಇಟ್ಕೊಬೋದಾಗಿತ್ತು ಕಾಡು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಇಟ್ಕೊಬೋದಾಗಿತ್ತು ಅಷ್ಟೊಂದು ಬಡ್ಜೆಟ್ ಬಂದಿದೆ ನಾವು ಕೇಳಿದ ಪ್ರಕಾರ ಅದರಿಂದ ಏನು ಪ್ರಯೋಜನ ಇಲ್ಲ ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಆಯ್ತು ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಏನು ಅದರಿಂದ ಏನು ಲಾಭ ಆಯ್ತು United Nations last year looking at the right to development, which is very interesting about interrelation between the right to development and the need for conservation. And again and again and again, it comes back to who is heard, who's, who has the right to manage the resources where they live. And so, yeah, I was also speaking there about participatory video, which is used increasingly as part of um, the, the assessment process for all development and conservation projects done right, you go out and spend time in the community, help them to map the situation as they see it, train them to use the camera themselves, and then to decide how they want to tell their own stories in their own terms, in their own language, operating the cameras themselves. So they're communicating with peers, which is so different the way people are to a camera when it's somebody they know and feel as an equal behind there. There's suddenly balance is introduced to the situation. I mean, I did my best to come and they, they said, please, if you come and film here, at least send the film back. Because some of the people don't. They just come and it's just another extraction. So that's why I went back straight away with it. And then again, five years later, just to see. And, and it was a really, really moving situation. But, you know, we failed, the project failed. Everything failed about that, but we learned. So, you know, next time we can tell better. <laughs> and just imagine, just I don't have a mention of the Coney 2012 thing. I, I too could spend a day talking about that, but just imagine if it had been the child soldiers themselves who had made that film and had the real authentic knowledge there of what was needed there for their situation and to recover from that. So, yeah. We now have these incredible technologies in all our hands. You know, mobile phones are all over Africa, South America, in places there's no electricity last year. I saw people selling um, SIM, SIM cards and, um, and credit. And this, nobody really knows where it's changing. And it seems to be this kind of wild west front line of information sharing. And uh, the power the, the contribution that we can make to human rights work internationally using this stuff is just unbelievable. As long as we always remember who is speaking and when the noisy and the powerful and the privileged are being a little bit too noisy and too powerful and too privileged to say, hang on, let's hear from the people at the bottom end of this and let's make sure they have a voice in this. Because when things feel really unfair, I mean, I spoke earlier about you get riots and things in our cities. This job I ended up doing last year, again, I, I just got a call, people saying, please, can you come and help us to represent a situation? And this came from someone I've worked with in Friends of the Earth International, who is part of a women's empowerment network in West Africa, where they're trying to stop the abuse of women accused of witchcraft. And maybe some of you heard lately in East London, there was a terrible case of a young boy who was battered to death in a flat by his own family who got it into their head. Because my understanding, I ended up doing quite a lot of research into witchcraft accusations, what happened here several hundred years ago, what's still happening in many parts of the world, including on the edges of our own is that when things feel crazy, out of control, unfair, and you don't have a handle on it, you don't have any tools of empowerment, what people do is they, they keep the cat. You know, you come in from a bad day at work, you can't do anything about your boss, so you kick the cat, you take it out from someone less powerful, someone you do have that. 
And in many places, increasingly, that's children. Victoria can be able to be close here. Um, or it's all older women, and no longer productive. That was the big shift in this country, was the shift from a more sort of ground earth based community-based value system into a more productive system. So women are no longer, no longer productive. Suddenly, they're eating food and they're getting that space and they've got some land and they want to say, well, you do it all, please. So this was a very, very strange journey to go uh, work in West Africa and kind of stop this kind of abuse. And I've got um, a little, just a 30-second steam and a face there for the film which we made, which called what I used to know, The Road to Ghana's Witches Camps. And we made it for Ghana TV, so it's very much within their culture, and I'm trying now to make a version of the international. Witches, we've heard about them. People are wrongly accused, banished, and some being killed. The Constitution recognizes cultural practices, but those that are negative, those that dehumanize, are no longer acceptable in modern day life. Now, I'm going to say, 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 I'm i <laughs> Hm, <laughs> Thank you. 